Now, on Race to Save the Planet, the miracle of modern farming, it feeds the world, but the earth is cracking under the strain. It was fertile, virgin land that had everything in it that nature could produce. There are alternatives, new ways to fight insects without poisoning nature or ourselves, new ways to preserve and fertilize the soil. Around the world, farmers are discovering how to work with nature, how to save the earth, feed the world. Major funding for Race to Save the Planet is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project and public television viewers. Corporate funding is provided by Ocean Spray. Our continuing aim is to preserve and protect what we cannot create. Additional funding is provided by Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Carnegie Corporation of New York, and by the following. This episode of Race to Save the Planet is about one of the oldest ways that mankind has manipulated the environment, farming. Farming has never really been natural. Nature likes a great diversity of plants and animals, while farming artificially encourages just a few. Long ago, farmers discovered that the closer they came to nature, if their fields grew a wide variety of crops, for example, the easier their job. Recently, though, farming has been changing moving away from nature and running into environmental disaster. Now, to solve their problems, farmers all over the world are coming up with new ideas on working with nature. Modern intensive farming, huge fields of single crops, artificial fertilizers, chemicals to fight insects and weeds, large-scale irrigation, crops anytime, any place. Modern farming has produced a bonanza, nearly tripling yields since 1950 and staying well ahead of a world population that doubled at the same time. The surplus is greatest in Europe and America, and some poorer countries have surpluses too. But in 50 years, world population will double again. Can farmers keep on working these wonders? That could be tough. The environment is showing signs of wear. Topsoil is eroding away. Agricultural chemicals are beginning to lose their magic. In many places, adding more pesticides, for example, no longer kills more insects. At the same time, those chemicals are contaminating the environment. We should be reducing, not increasing, their use. But there are some farmers who are working in new, environmentally beneficial ways, keeping their land fertile without the use of chemicals, for example. The new ideas make sense all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, Europe and America, preserving the soil and helping in the age-old battle against pests. These new strategies, some of them amazingly simple, will play an increasing part in the struggle to feed the world without destroying the environment. California's Central Valley Fully one quarter of America's fruit and vegetables is grown here using modern intensive methods. These crops take a lot of labor. While this pruning crew needs the work, like farm workers around the world, they are also becoming aware of the hazards. 
This is a typical example. An almond orchard is to receive a winter spray with an organophosphate, a highly toxic pesticide which needs careful handling. The aim is to kill insects during their dormant phase, one of several sprayings the orchard may get in a year. The problem is that the sprays affect more than just insects. Luis Hernandez lives in the Central Valley town of McFarland. He used to be a pesticide sprayer until his six-year-old son Jaime developed cancer. Five months ago, it was discovered Jaime had a rare cancer of the lymph system. He had emergency surgery and now comes to the hospital twice a month for chemotherapy. Feeling better? The problem with cancers like this is that their exact cause is still a mystery. Medical science can only treat them and hope for the best. Jaime's pediatrician is Nashad al Haid. I think his chances are, are pretty good, although the prognosis is guarded in these cases. But he's doing fairly well for his condition. For Jaime's father, the horrible suspicion is that somehow his work with agricultural chemicals caused his son's cancer. For me to see him like this is very hard. My hope is that he will be cured. That is my hope. So I have to keep going for my son. Jaime is not alone in his misfortune. Marta Salinas lives in another McFarland neighborhood. In this corner house, the White House, this is Teresa Buntuelas, a little girl. Our first cancer diagnosis, she was about a year and a half when she was diagnosed with cancer, and she died. And right behind her house is the yellow house where Juanito Rodriguez lived, and he died of cancer. And then right in the corner is uh, the Bravos, Mario Bravo, he died of cancer. And then house next to them, we have a little girl that has the birth defects. The next house, the greenhouse, has skin rashes. And where this trailer house is, that's Randy Rosales. He's one of the young teenagers that was diagnosed with cancer. He is in remission. The yellow house and the blue house have skin rashes. In the last 12 years, at least 13 McFarland children have developed cancer, three times the expected number. While most of the fathers work in the fields where chemicals, including suspected carcinogens, are used, that's only a circumstantial link, because cancers have many causes. Year after year, the fields of the Central Valley, like so many around the world, are saturated with toxic chemicals. After their brief, useful life on crops, many chemicals take on a second life. They become unwanted, persistent contaminants. This well was closed when DBCP, a carcinogenic pesticide banned in the 70s, showed up. There are 2,000 contaminated wells like this in the valley. Tests commonly revealed nitrates, probably from fertilizers, in the wells here too. It was once thought that agricultural chemicals would break down in the soil. But now it's clear many don't. McFarland found pesticides 1,400 feet deep. They've had to install this expensive plant to remove nitrates. But processing for pesticides costs too much. Right now, half their wells are closed. Whether the others are truly safe is a question McFarland residents have to live with. And people like Luis Hernandez also have to live with another possibility. Every year in California, about a thousand workers get medical treatment for exposure to farm chemicals. Are they poisoning their families too? If what made my son sick isn't in the water, it's something that I could have brought home since I work with pesticides. Because it's not normal for so many kids to get sick like this. This red-tailed hawk was near death a few days ago. A case of pesticide poisoning. Go. Now it's going back home, but not exactly to the wild. 
because hawks like to spend the winter in the Central Valley's almond orchards, which are filled with the small birds and rodents they prey on. But there are some forms of life here which the growers cannot tolerate. Insect eggs, which in the spring will become active pests. Hence, the winter spraying. The organophosphate used is a nerve poison, and everything in the orchard gets a dose. Undesirable insects and desirable wildlife. Hawks are especially vulnerable. They've been dying or ending up in emergency wildlife centers like this one in the hands of biologists like Donna Burt. There's no lesions or anything inside its mouth. Um, no evidence of collision injury in the head. No, you know, bruises or anything like that. Covering the bird's eyes reduces stress during its examination. Donna has now seen dozens of hawks with pesticide poisoning. And within a few minutes, she's fairly certain that this is yet another. Okay. 96 degrees. That's uh, about 10 degrees low. So she's got a slow heart rate, slow breathing, no broken bones or damage of any sort. She's a pretty fat bird. She's been eating a lot recently. Um, this is beginning to look a lot more like a pesticide. Confirmation she's right will need a blood test, but the bird may die if they wait for the results, so the antidote is given immediately. I'm gonna give the bird some atropine. Atropine is a specific antidote for organophosphate poisoning, and it should immediately raise the heart rate. It actually removes the poison, chemically removes the poison from the bird's system. The blood test confirmed the diagnosis. And a week later, the hawk was doing better. But for every hawk that receives this life-saving treatment, there are hundreds more out in the orchards living with smaller doses of poison in their systems. That's according to state wildlife researchers who have been trapping and testing birds that appear healthy. The blood tests taken by the Department of Fish and Game on the hawks around the almond orchards showed that between 50 and 100 percent of those hawks had the effects of the poisoning. Um, and we don't know what effects that may have on their long-term survival or on their reproductive success. Like McFarland, agricultural communities around the world are left with the same uncertainty. There's no doubt that workers and wildlife alike are being exposed to toxic chemicals. Modern agriculture presents a disturbing contradiction. Luis Hernandez. Agriculture has to continue because it is from that that we all live. But at the same time, if what is being used in agriculture is harming people's health, I definitely think there is a serious conflict there. Is modern food safe? The government estimates 6,000 Americans a year get cancer from pesticide residues. Others say that's much too low. There's no doubt that consumers are worried. Well, I don't want to poison myself or my kids or my family or anything. I would like to buy things that are free from pesticides. Well, I feel that we don't know the long-term effects of the chemicals that are being used. We're really at the mercy of the growers and the farmers of how honest they are and what, how they grow their food. And is it really safe? Agriculture used to be different. It used to fit more easily into the natural world. And that's plainly illustrated at Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, where historians have reconstructed a typical farm from the early 1800s. Although it looks like a movie set, it's a real working farm, designed to show visitors how farmers in the past used ingenuity to accomplish what chemicals and big machines do today. How strong do they get? Well, that's a good question. For a farmer in the 1830s, what's important is how much plowing they can do. Andrew Baker is an expert on the techniques used in the past to maintain soil fertility and control pests. So we've never really tested them for pulling a They depend on one important idea. The key feature is diversification. 
that a typical farm in the 1830s is very diversified. It has uh, a variety of livestock, it grows a variety of crops. This year, on one plot, they grew hay grasses for cattle feed, while on the next plot, they grew corn, now harvested. In the spring, potatoes will be planted here, then oats, and then hay grasses again. This rotation system has many benefits. Insects and weeds which thrive in one crop die out in a different crop. That's natural pest control. And some plants in the rotation put nitrogen into the soil. That's natural fertilizer. Big, 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 big. Some rotation crops also feed farm animals. They eat grasses and root crops not consumed by humans. In turn, they produce manure, rich in essential plant nutrients. So a hundred years ago, the farmer kept going and made money with natural methods. If he was careful in his management of land and his manures, he would be able to keep the soil in good enough tilts to continue on providing that level of uh, sustenance that he needed, that level of production, both for himself and for market. But this effective system, invented in Europe in the 18th century, didn't last long. In the 19th century, human population doubled to about two billion. Fifty years later, it had doubled again. To feed everyone, farmers had to get more food from every acre of land. That meant abandoning the old systems and stimulating production artificially with chemical fertilizers and synthetic pesticides. At first, it was a stunning success, but there were problems looming. This crop is rice. It feeds half the world. And here, in Indonesia, it's provided one of the world's best-known examples of how modern intensive farming can fail. Indonesia was self-sufficient in rice for many centuries. But by 1960, the population explosion had forced it to become the world's number one rice importer. The government decided they had to increase production of their staple food at all costs. So a series of steps was begun, which was to sweep away traditional techniques. The first step was designed to produce multiple crops of rice in a year. That meant irrigation. Dams were built to allow year-round flooding of many new areas. Traditionally, a farmer would alternate different dry and rainy season crops, which disrupted pests, just like the Sturbridge-style rotation. Now, that protection was gone, although the traditional rice varieties grown still had some natural resistance to pests. But a development at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines was to change that. Here, scientists had bred a new rice variety which would grow year-round, and it was strong enough to carry an extra heavy yield of grain, so it could take advantage of artificial fertilizers. IR8 was the result, and it looked like a major breakthrough. Chief plant breeder, Gurdev Kush. And we found out that it was giving about uh, three times the yield of the traditional varieties. We, we immediately thought that we have something, which was the answer to the food problems of the, of the world. But IR8 had problems. It not only needed expensive fertilizer, but also pesticides. It was more vulnerable to insects than traditional varieties. Still, the scientists thought the trade-off was worth it. We knew that IR8 was susceptible, but we were really excited about that at that time about the yield. So we, we really pushed it onto the farmers' fields. IR8 was adopted throughout Asia, and yields nearly doubled. There were similar developments with wheat. And this combination of high-yield crops with irrigation, fertilizers, and pesticides came to be known as the Green Revolution. It was a dramatic success. Within a few years, many countries, Indonesia included, were producing surpluses. Our populous world could feed itself with ease. But within a few years, that victory had turned sour as the rice fields turned brown. 
In Indonesia, huge areas of dead rice plants had to be cut and burned. The crops had been devastated by insect infestation on a scale unprecedented in the country's farming history. The disaster had happened because the fields had lost the stability which traditional methods provided. First, by eliminating rotation and planting rice all year, farmers had provided an ideal breeding ground for insects, particularly the brown plant hopper. With year-round food supplies, hopper numbers exploded. And not only were there more hoppers around, but the new rice varieties were less able to resist their attack. The result? Hopper burn, as it's called. Fields of desiccated rice plants sucked dry by armies of hoppers. The new techniques themselves had created the problem. Ayan Oka, an Indonesian government plant pest expert, recalls the mounting sense of alarm at the time. In 74, 75, 76, we had the greatest brown brown hopper disasters. Hundreds of hundreds of thousands of hectares of rice fields were hopper burned. So no single grain yield could be harvested during that time. The understandable response of farmers had been to step up spraying. But when they did so, things only seemed to get worse. Quite soon it was clear to the scientists what was going on. In nature, everything has its enemy. Spiders, for example, like to eat plant hoppers. But spraying kills both hoppers and spiders. Peter Kenmore of the UN Food and Agricultural Organization was working in Indonesia at the time and recognized the problem. The natural biological control in those rice fields was destroyed and the pests were allowed to reproduce without restriction. And this is called resurgence. You spray and the pest populations flare back. Soon, farmers were spraying constantly. The spray was carried out not based on numbers of brown plant hopper. They just spray according to calendar schedule. For, for example, once a week at least. Now if there is still brown plant hopper around, they applied more frequent spray, two, three times a week. Sometimes it's twice a day, in the morning and the afternoon. Too much pesticide. The crisis reached such proportions that in 1986, President Suharto himself prohibited the use of 57 pesticides on rice. Only nine were permitted, and they had to be used in a new, more naturally based system called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. The Green Revolution had to be salvaged. An army of government teachers began introducing IPM to millions of farmers across the country. The message? Don't depend on chemicals to destroy the hopper. Use natural methods instead. And the first step? Go back to crop rotation. To disrupt the hopper's reproduction, Indonesia once again started growing crops other than rice for one-third of the year. A television spot from the Philippines shows the next step. Protect good insects. The idea of IPM is to work with nature, and that means farmers have to get to know their fields. They have to recognize beneficial insects, keep track of hoppers, and only spray limited amounts of specialized chemicals. IPM is not easy. Only 5% of Indonesia's farmers have been trained to use it so far. But their pesticide use has dropped by 75%, and their yields are going back up. These methods are more than just a new formula for growing rice. They're finding application in many different types of agriculture around the world, 
and they combine modern knowledge with traditional wisdom, where the resources of the land, like beneficial insects, are recognized and encouraged. Peter Kenmore sees two benefits, one financial, the other less obvious. Insecticides can represent anywhere from 5 to 20 percent of the cash costs of rice production, depending on where you are in Asia. And using IPM cuts that down by at least 50 percent and often by 90 percent. We thought that was the most important thing when we first started training farmers about seven years ago. We were wrong. What we found out was that farmers were much more motivated and much more excited about new knowledge about understanding what was happening in their rice fields, about understanding natural control of pests so that they had a peaceful feeling about that rice field, they weren't afraid. There is perhaps no land more devastated than this by lack of understanding. It was once the lush prime rangeland of Northeast Australia. Brian Roberts, a leading soil conservation expert, is painfully aware of his country's dubious distinction. We do hold the world record in terms of the amount of land that has been damaged by such a small population over such a short time. We have damaged something like 11 acres per person, as opposed to the American figure, which is about 3.5 acres. In the search for higher yields and higher profits, the world's farmers have been taking more and more from the land and putting less and less back. Nowhere is that better illustrated than here. Many ranches are so vast, several hundred thousand acres each, that helicopters are used at roundup time. Charlie Hayward raises thousands of cattle a year for Australian and American markets. When he bought this ranch 10 years ago, he thought much the same way as the first settlers did about this rich, seemingly inexhaustible land. The basis of the early settlers was cheap land. The most important thing was to occupy it. And then, of course, there was no management. It was fertile, virgin land that had everything in it that nature could produce. There's an old saying here, if it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't, chop it down. That's certainly what the European settlers did a hundred years ago. In these parts, they tore down the trees to plant imported grasses for cattle. Grasses that grow faster than the native varieties. The problem is, there are droughts in these parts too. Every few years, large patches of grass, native or introduced, burn out. And whether the range can recover or not critically depends on how much stress the cattle then put on it. In recent years, ranchers in the area have seen that with each new drought, less and less land comes back. Most ranchers attributed their grass problem to bad luck with the weather. Charlie Hayward suspected their management was at fault. So for a rancher, he made an eccentric move. He took a correspondence course in soil conservation and then invited the instructor, Brian Roberts, to see the situation firsthand. Now, are these bear patches moving back? Do you find that these tufts of good grass are in fact weakening and moving back? Is, is this humus disappearing? Well, yes. What, what do you reckon? It, well, it is in some places. The bad news for Charlie was that the biggest problem on the ranch was simply too many cattle. And that was made worse by the introduced grasses, which can't recover as easily from drought. The process was simple. The grass was eaten so fast that it couldn't reseed itself. When the rains came, there was nothing to hold the precious topsoil in place. A single inch of soil takes 500 years to form. The ranchers were dumping their land into the ocean at an impossible rate. Now Brian Roberts is offering advice on what to do next. So we've got to do something to prevent, firstly, prevent the water getting in uh, at, at a velocity. So you've been washing your fences away? That's yeah. right. Yeah, look at this. 
About a third of the region's grassland has been badly damaged. And the best advice Brian Roberts has to offer is that the ranchers should cut back their herds. In the past, most people have tried to maximize their animal numbers, but it's quite clear that if they reduce their numbers by about one third, they get better fed animals, higher calving percentages, and do much better in the droughts. The Australian ranchers, in their search for high yields, came up against environmental limits, just like the limits which Indonesian rice farmers encountered. Yet how simple it can be to avoid disaster. Here it's a matter of reducing the animals and rotating them onto different sections of range. And Brian Roberts is suggesting another step. He's encouraging reseeding in the most damaged areas. But this time, with the original native grasses, they work better here, in the same way a rice paddy works better with its natural beneficial insects. Now, for Charlie Hayward, this is the way the land must be treated. It's not going to be any pleasure for me to see this devastating thing happening and not doing a thing about it. And if we don't all get together and sort of attack the thing, both departmentally, governmentally, taxation-wise and technology-wise, if we don't do something about it, we are committing a sin. It's a mighty hard road that our poor hand is pulled. In the 1930s, it was America that was committing the sin. Forty million acres of the Great Plains turned to desert, the Dust Bowl. As in Australia, drought, combined with abusive farming practices, were to blame. During the First World War, farmers had expanded production onto steeper slopes and skipped rotation crops leaving fields open and vulnerable to the devil of soil erosion, as the government films put it. I've been getting away with it for centuries. Who's going to stop me? We will. What you've stolen, we're putting back with soil building crops, terracing, strip cropping, contour farming. No, no. And we're all ready to help. That was a close shave. Bang. Treat the land better, farmers were urged. Stop water erosion by plowing along the slope, and not up and down. Plan in strips so no large areas of soil lie exposed to the wind. Go back to crop rotation. Plant crops that help soil fertility. And within a decade, the land was back in condition. But good stewardship didn't last. In recent decades, as world food demand has grown, many farmers have dropped soil conservation practices. The result? Erosion is once again common on American farms. But why aren't farmers worried about losing their topsoil? The answer is simple. They can make up for lost fertility by adding more artificial fertilizer, at least for the short term. All over the world, farmers are doing the same. But nobody knows how long it can continue. From the World Watch Institute in Washington, Lester Brown. We are now losing about 24 billion tons of topsoil each year in excess of the rate of new soil formation. The world's farmers must therefore now try to feed nearly 90 million more people each year, but with 24 billion fewer tons of topsoil than they had the year before. One does not have to have a degree in agronomy to know that, we, that these two trends, population and the loss of topsoil, cannot both continue indefinitely. We are now approaching a time of reckoning. This is the Sahel region of Africa, just below the Sahara Desert. Here, Lester Brown's time of reckoning is right now. Population is going up and soil fertility is going down. In the last 20 years, food production per person has dropped by one-fifth. The land is overstressed. In traditional farming here, a field was prepared by burning vegetation. After that, it was planted for a few years and then left to recover for at least 10 years. But now, farmers are using the same land year after year. 
Fertilizers would help, but they cost money, and they need water to make them work. Both are scarce. At the same time, trees are disappearing, both from increasing numbers of animals and increasing demand for fuel. As pressures on trees increase, many people turn to animal dung and leftovers from crops to burn in their cooking stoves. Resources that would better be used to fertilize the soil. The result is the Sahel's own dust bowl. The soil is losing its fertility and it's blowing away. Just like in America in the 30s or Indonesia more recently, the land has been pushed too far. And like Australia, the process has been aggravated by drought. But that doesn't mean that the situation here is hopeless. This is one of the most effective things to do. In a valley in Niger, the International Aid Agency, CARE, helped set up a program to plant avenues of trees, over 400 miles of them. The trees hold in moisture and protect the crops and soil from the wind. Sorghum and millet are the staples, crops adapted to dry conditions. Their yields are now up about 20%. Windbreak trees were also adopted after America's Dust Bowl, although many have since been removed. The Green Revolution's new crops need fertilizer, which needs water to work so it bypassed Africa's dryland farmers. But less dramatic projects like this can still make a big difference. We benefited a lot from the trees that were planted on our farms, and our lives improved a lot. Crop yields are much better now than in the days of the terrible dust storms. The windbreak trees provide another benefit, firewood. As long as they're not over-harvested, they'll relieve pressure on trees throughout the valley. The environment here may get a chance to recover. All over the neighboring country of Burkina Faso, there's another simple but effective project underway. It's also aimed at conservation of resources. But this time, of precious rainwater. Low rock dams are being arranged to catch the water. But in this flat landscape, that requires a sensitive surveying device to detect the subtle gradients. This level uses a tube of water running between two measuring posts to align the dams. When the brief rainy season comes, the low dams will catch the water before it can run off. Then it can soak into the soon-to-be-planted fields. The surveying level, introduced by Oxfam, was picked up by a regional conservation group dedicated to helping the Sahel's farmers, who are mostly very poor. It's led by Bernard Udrego. You cannot teach people things in a day, but bit by bit, they are learning. The proof is already there. People are really catching on. One of the group's largest projects started with the manufacture of wire mesh. Then mesh containers were filled with rocks to construct this huge dam. Once again, rainwater collects here and soaks into the ground. Enough even to replenish local wells. The wells last through the dry season. So that means vegetable gardens can now be grown all year. Here, the group offers training on how to conserve another resource. They're making compost from animal manure and crop residues. It provides fertilizer and preserves soil condition. It's easy to assume that these simple measures, planting trees, conserving soil and water, being taken in the Sahel are only needed by the poor farmers of the world. But America's lost soil, Australia's devastated rangeland, and Indonesia's rice disaster show that no farmer can afford to ignore how the earth works. At the same time, many poor countries have very high birth rates. 
If they're going to feed themselves, they recognize that that must change. Bernard Udrego. Nous nous battons sur deux fronts. Premièrement, on essaie de réguler les naissances. S'il y a beaucoup d'enfants, we are fighting on two fronts. First, we are trying to regulate the birth rate. If there are many children, the little food we produce is not enough. Bien fort. Ça c'est un. Donc le premier front. Deuxième front, on essaie de produire. The second front. We are trying to produce our traditional crops, and we are trying to produce these well. If the harvest is good, and there are fewer mouths to feed, everyone will be well nourished. There will come a day when we will eat well, eat without hunger. Over half the food produced in developing countries is grown by small-scale farmers. In their search for higher yields, they run up against environmental limits as resoundingly as the large-scale farmers of America or Australia. Limits which no farmer can afford to ignore. The plains of North Dakota, some of the world's richest farmland. Fred Kirschenman farms 3,000 acres here, but he farms it in a way that acknowledges that the earth has limits, that natural processes must be understood, that the resources of the land should not be squandered. He's called an organic farmer. What we're trying to do is to, uh, to take a piece of ground and develop sustainable systems that will continue to sustain that soil in perpetual uh, cultivation. Fred went organic 14 years ago, soon after he took the farm over from his father. It's an old farm family, and they were both uneasy about the symptoms displayed on their modern chemical-based farm. But they're not hard. The aggregates of the soil were no longer as crumbly. Uh, the soil was finer, become more compacted, uh, which meant it was absorbing less moisture. Uh, so we were needing more moisture to produce the same, no same level of crops. Uh, we were no longer getting the response that we've been getting from conventional fertilizers. We had to add more fertilizer to get the same yield levels. Uh, weeds were becoming more of a problem rather than less despite the herbicides. And so those were all indicators that, uh, you know, that something was wrong with that system. This is still a modern mechanized farm, but its key feature is diversity. It's gone back to the old idea that crop rotation helps maintain the soil and control insects and weeds. They used to grow just wheat and barley here. Now this year, this field's growing rye. Last year it was wheat. Before that it was clover, a soil building crop. And before that, sunflowers. In all, they grow eight different crops in three separate rotations. Cows are important on the farm. When Fred's father could get his fertilizer out of a bag, he stopped using cow manure on the land. It actually became a waste problem. Now, once again, the cows provide organic fertilizer. Because it's bulky, it makes the soil more spongy, helping retain moisture. And it doesn't wash out of the soil quickly, which is how chemical fertilizer ends up polluting groundwater. Fred also grows what's called green manure. Hidden in this buckwheat field is a second crop, clover, a special plant that absorbs nitrogen, an essential plant nutrient, out of the air. So once the buckwheat's harvested, he just cuts and leaves the clover, and he's fertilized the field. It's a modern variation on a trick well known to farmers of the last century. Overall, Fred can keep his soil in top condition. This field uh, has had sweet clover on it, which has been cut with this tool, and, and all of the residue has been left on the surface. And we have now spread composted livestock manure. With those two inputs, we are able to raise four crops from this field without any kind of fertilizers added to it. Organic farms are cheaper to run than chemical ones, because chemicals are expensive. So why don't all farmers go organic? Because of the risk. Expert knowledge is needed. Fred spent several years figuring out the crop rotations that work on his land. Farmers also won't switch because government subsidies encourage maximum acreage of just a few crops. 
Fred Kirshenman explains. Around here, that means a lot of farmers will have most of their acreage base into uh, wheat and barley. Uh, 90% of their acres in, in many instances. That means they don't have any acres left to put into a crop rotation. And without a crop rotation, the system won't work. And in order to get into a crop rotation, they've got to give up part of their crop base, which means part of their government payment. So they take a, 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 an economic kick in the teeth right to start with. The most surprising thing is that organic methods produce as much food over time as chemical. That's because organic yields a steady output year to year, whereas chemical is more erratic high in a good year, then low when bad weather comes or insects strike. Patrick Madden, on the left, is visiting an organic orange grove in California. All types of farmers are now recognizing that organic really works. There's even a new U.S. Agriculture Department program on low input methods. Madden is its director. Many people view low input agriculture as low output agriculture, and that is they feel that if we reduce our dependence or our use of various agricultural chemicals that, that our yields are going to drop and people are going to be starving left and right and so forth. And uh, I, I see so many examples uh, that prove that that's, that need not be the case. I've seen farms that, are, that have yields at or above uh, the county average, uh, without dependence upon these substances. It can be done. It can be done, and increasingly, consumers want it done. Produce guaranteed free from chemicals brings premium prices in the supermarket, a fact not lost on growers. Hello, this is Dean Walsh from Pure Pack. Uh, I'm an organic grower, packer, and shipper in Oxnard, California. Dean Walsh is the president of Pure Pack a company that only grows organic vegetables. His sales force proves every day that farming that's good for the environment is also great for business. Although a mere 2% of U.S. farm output is now organic, that's going up fast. Since they got their organic certification here a year ago, business has never been better. 10 remain naked. What I do have. 30 remain sleeved. 76 readily sleeved. All right, bye. Mm -hmm. Walsh is not primarily an environmentalist. Right, let's see what's going on. He just wants a way to beat the competition. Everybody's slicing, dicing, chopping, over wrapping, uh, just marketing their product in a, a different way. And uh, we saw that there was a market niche for organic, and so we went after that market. As with the Kirshenman, switching this large, thousand-acre operation over to organic was not easy. It's difficult to get good advice from official sources or, hardly surprising, from chemical suppliers. The methods of the past were one guide. To keep down weeds, for instance, one alternative to chemical herbicides combines machine and hand cultivation. So an organic farmer may have higher labor costs, but save on chemicals. Like Fred Kirscherman, Dean Walsh has added a modern twist. This transplanting machine plants partially grown seedlings instead of seeds. These are lettuce. Weeds can't compete as easily with the young plants, so now there's less need to hoe. Insect control is another challenge, especially during the transition from using insecticides. In these artichoke fields, for example, aphids have infested the crop because there aren't yet enough predator insects around. Yeah, I think we've got the spray. It's, uh, we've got a pretty good buildup in here. You think that'll get it back into a, a balance? Oh yeah, I think so, yeah. Sprays are used on organic farms, but not sprays of toxic chemicals. This one's better known as soap. It dries out and kills the soft-bodied aphids but it won't harm the aphids' predators, hard-shelled ladybugs. Ladybugs are being reintroduced into the fields, and the likelihood is that when they're established, they'll keep aphids under control, without the need for any sprays at all. In the end, the crop was down by 
but it was a year when conventional farms did badly too. Now it's likely the worst is over in establishing this field. Overall, for PurePak, natural methods have cost a little more, though Dean Walsh believes that will change. The more we learn to do it better, the less it'll cost, hopefully. I believe that uh, we have already decreased our costs on organic in the last two years, and we're just one company, let alone with the industry working towards that goal. Modern organic farmers are showing that yields can be good, costs can be controlled, while the environment, soil and water, can be protected over the long term. But can farmers feed the world over the long term? Right now, food supply is growing more slowly than world population. Basic agricultural resources like water for irrigation can't keep up. Everywhere, farmland is steadily being built over. The farmers of the world are already pushing their land too hard, losing topsoil, destroying fertility. Yet, to meet future demand, each acre must produce more than it does today. And simply intensifying environmentally damaging techniques won't work. From the World Watch Institute, Lester Brown. What we're now beginning to see is that the major technologies that have contributed to the enormous growth in world food output over the last generation, chemical fertilizers, irrigation, hybrid corn, high-yielding dwarf wheats and rices, have now pretty much run their course in at least some important parts of the world. As a result, we're seeing a slowdown in growth. For future growth, some now look not to the field, but to the laboratory. At Washington University in St. Louis, Roger Beachy is working on putting qualities like disease or drought resistance directly into the genetic makeup of plants. It would give permanent protection to a crop, generation after generation. Biotechnology, as it's called, offers enormous promise, especially for poorer countries. Biotechnology has the potential to increase yields dramatically in many countries without uh, continued increase in cost of pesticides and, and expensive chemicals that are normally used in farming in the West. Tomatoes so far have been genetically altered using laboratory techniques to resist mosaic virus. After being infected with the virus, the resistant plants on the left are completely healthy. These tomatoes that you see here are now 10 days after inoculation, and those plants that don't, don't carry the new gene are really quite sick. They have yellow leaves and they're crumpled and they're quite distorted. Whereas those plants that carry the new gene, the introduced gene, have resisted the infection and show no signs of the disease symptoms. What that means for the farmer is that there'll be a higher yield. Such a disease can cause losses of between 20 and 30 and 40 percent under certain conditions. Virus resistant tomatoes are now in field tests. Most research so far has been done on the big money-making crops of Western countries. Less work has been done on major food crops of poorer countries, where it could have great impact. Although Roger Beachy is trying to add virus resistance to rice. It's tempting to see biotechnology as some miraculous solution to future world food problems, but Beachy cautions against it. There's going to have to be an integrated an integrated management of this whole situation. We're going to need to control our population. We're going to need to, to produce more food. Plant biotechnology is only going to be, a, a, be one very small part. It can be a very important part to the answer, but it's not going to be the sole uh, champion to uh, eliminate uh, poverty and, uh, and hunger. It's going to take very many approaches. Biotechnology on the farm is controversial. Some worry that it's meddling with nature as we've never done before. Others say it's working with nature, only in a new way. If there's anything that modern farming has shown, it's that working with nature is the only way forward. Every time we do otherwise, in Australia, America, Africa, and Asia, we court disaster. Farmers everywhere will be unable to feed the world unless they reach that understanding. Today, farmers are entering a time of great uncertainty. As we're showing in another episode, the greenhouse effect is likely to severely disrupt the world's weather patterns. 
That'll be a new source of stress on farmland everywhere, making the challenge to feed the world even harder to meet. So it's going to be all the more important for farmers to be working with nature rather than against it. Please join me next time for Race to Save the Planet. Major funding for Race to Save the Planet is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project and public television viewers. Corporate funding is provided by Ocean Spray. Our continuing aim is to preserve and protect what we cannot create. Additional funding is provided by Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Carnegie Corporation of New York, and by the following. For more information on the college telecourse, video cassettes, off-air videotaping, and books based on the series, call 1-800-LEARNER. This is PBS. The Global Ecology Handbook, published by Beacon Press, is available for $16.95 plus shipping. A transcript of this program is available for $5. Please call 1-800-TALK-SHOW or send a check to Race to Save the Planet, Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007. Next on Race to Save the Planet, the problem of waste there are better ways to deal with it. Recycling, it's big in Japan. Industrial waste, Denmark copes well. Best of all, don't even produce waste. Watch Waste Not, Want Not, next time on Race to Save the Planet.